Hi, I'm Ashley Eckstein, voice of Ahsoka Tano, and you're listening to the Knights of Ren. The Knights of Ren podcast is brought to you by Cool Stuff, Inc., your source for Star Wars Destiny singles, sealed product, and more. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com. Show me again the power of the darkness. D20 Radio, where gamers roll. D20Radio.com. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, to episode 310 of the Knights of Ren, and we are so excited. Jay is back with us, and we have a special guest, Taxter, aka Nick, the world's runner-up and a top four contender at Gen Con, is here with us, and welcome, everybody. How are you guys doing today? Doing good. Doing all right. Doing good. Finally getting back in the swing of things after a very low amount of sleep at Gen Con. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I believe it. So speaking of which, Jay and Nick were both at Gen Con. So Jay, why don't you lead off? Tell us what happened. What'd you see? How's Gen Con this year? Considering, you know, you've been two years in a row now. Uh, yeah, this definitely wasn't my first rodeo when it comes to Gen Con. Uh, I've been there like seven times now. But uh, this year was pretty cool being the 50th. And I was pretty excited for both Destiny and L5R and hanging out with people. Uh, unfortunately, due to a lot of situations, uh, I really didn't sleep. And because Destiny was on Saturday, by that time, it caught up to me pretty badly just to get right into it. I brought FN Bala Guard. I hadn't really tested it much. As most of you know, I was playing Luke Ray and in the final throws of trying to do testing before Gen Con, it really wasn't panning out. And so I jumped ship and played a modified version of Rick's deck. Uh, first two opponents were both emo kids. Amusingly, the second one used the Edgelord version as his base, which was pretty cool. That was the version I played uh, back when I won the store championship. Both games went fairly quickly and fairly well for me uh so after two rounds i was 2-0 and thought you know maybe i'm gonna be okay but round three i ran into han snap which is a deck i have never played against ever um i had like heard rumors of it um in passing but wasn't even a list i would think to have test against so it's one of those things where with how little sleep i had it was very hard for me to kind of like figure out the best course of attack and what cards it was going to be using and what to do and he shielded an incredible amount before i could do any lasting damage i tried to take out han first and it looked like i was going to be okay but he managed to stabilize and eventually he just chewed through me and uh i lost the attrition war when he rolled a very very good spread off of uh, snap. So I at that point, I was 2-1. And then in my fourth round, I played one of our fans, and he was playing Pomaz in one of the most devastating games I've ever had in Destiny. Turn one, he thermaled. Turn two, he hit and ran into both of Poe's three for one range damage. Bear in mind, on turn one, I had enraged twice to try and get a resource lead. That obviously didn't help my situation. Turn three, he hit and ran into both of Poe's three for ones again. And keep in mind, like, Maz was like making money and shooting me for one and like they didn't even need to synergize he was already tearing me in half and then uh he followed up um with the extra money that he made from before logistic scene with planetary and all i can say about that round is at least i lost so definitively that there really wasn't a lot of like maybe i could have it was it was a slaughter i did manage to get to uh Z6 Riot Batons out, and I thought there was some hope in there, but no. So after that, I decided that the prospects of me day twoing were very low, and unfortunately, I had a really early flight. So unless I was extremely confident that A, I could day two, and B, I'd do well enough in day two to, you know, pay more to move my ticket, which I didn't, I decided to take another look around the show hall and see some friends and get something to eat and just kind of enjoy the rest of my time instead of trying to claw my way through the rest of the event. So I drove dropped but our buddy nick here uh he did a bit better so i'm gonna pass it on to him yeah so funny enough i almost dropped game one 
<laughs> I played against two stormtroopers and two tie pilots, and that guy got like five guns out by the end of turn two or round two. And that is basically the scariest thing that you can imagine facing. Just crap tons of guns. Crap tons of modifiers and dice that you can't do anything about with your guardian. And he even got a training off on one of his TIE pilots, so it was even worse. Just like, it came down to like one roll where he rolled a bunch of modifiers and no base damage. And then I rolled out like the remaining like three damage I needed on Phasma to win. But th- th- it was ridiculous how close game one came on that one. But uh, I did have my first loss in round three to a fun car that just... It hit, it hit the. It started with five weapons in hand, which he said wasn't ideal. I, I can understand that for sure. But just the way things worked out, he got a one cost thing from my hand with this uncar ability, and just was able to ramp into like seven or eight damage and put it all in Phasma in the first round. And then I was never really been able to stick anything solid to the board or even kill a character that game. It just everything went off for fun car on that one that's kind of what the deck does when it does it right but after that i got a palpatine in one of those somewhere in there i think that was round two uh, i think i faced the han snap that jay faced at some point and that was pretty easy i think i did seven damage to han in round one and it just i, I think that matchup's still pretty good for me either way because it doesn't do a lot of direct damage and i also have sabotage so even when it does get the planetary up- uprisings out it's not really a problem so that one wasn't too bad the the other one that i had that was really close was in, in round five, I think, versus another funk car. And that was uh, somebody that Sugi knew, at least. He, he said he knew Sugi from your local meta. And uh, that, that game was ridiculous. Just, I was like within three health from death after just like a super ridiculous funk car turn. And it's like, I, I don't know how I can come back from this because he had like eight health left on FN. And then the next turn started. I rolled out because I had gotten to go first and i just kind of rolled the nuts on him and it's like well i I guess it kind of comes back around that's just that's just destiny for you (laughs) you roll the nuts i rolled the nuts i rolled the nuts at the right time and it worked better i guess but it's like that just some of the games i didn't actually face any po mazes in swiss i did face an emo kids which is pretty good for phasma as well and in last round though i did face against joe honestly sarcastic who ended up winning the whole tournament so he was seven and or six and one, and I was six and one, and he had just he had gone six and zero, oh, so he was pretty positive that either way he'd make it in. So this is like, oh man, this guy that I, I played him the week before in the Artifice Three TTS tournament with my deck, and I lost a two out of three. We went to game three, but we I lost a two out of three, and it's like this is like the rematch. It's like I don't want to have this rematch right now because this is like this is what determines whether I get in or not, and. I don't even, he did not get any bound list off. That was very helpful. And it just kind of came down to a really, like, a, a really slow, thoughtful game. Like, it, it was a great game. He didn't roll ridiculous. I didn't really roll that ridiculous. It was just, there's a lot of puzzle put, piecing to put together. It was a really awesome game. And I ended up winning basically by one damage. He, he, had, he had to roll out Bala and hit two different sources of damage and to be able to claim and kill me with the secret facility battlefield but he only rolled out one and then he would be one damage short and i had like just enough i think showing to win so if he had if he had a removal too i also would have lost but like it, it just came down to the wire on that one so I, I won and i made it into the top 16 by one damage <laughs> so you mentioned uh before we go to the top 16 you mentioned the two of the the big i guess toughest matches that you had were against funkar uh throughout the rounds of swiss uh and what we found locally is phasma's pretty pretty bad matchup in that and that against funkar what did you put in to uh, your phasma list to kind of help you out in that matchup uh sabotage is probably the biggest one that can kind of help out with either the imperial inspections or the uh salvage stands if they're not getting the inspections out but to just be able to keep your money for later rounds but the self or sabotage is also extremely good against pomas for the for the planetary uprisings as well so so i think sabotage is a great fit for the deck for the weekend did you up your curve at all on the the upgrades in addition to that maybe trying to squeeze in uh three costers like rocket launchers or anything like that i had tried that a few weeks ago at the local store championship and that was like the worst that was the worst tournament i've ever had in my history of destiny i got destroyed by fun cars i put rockets i had rockets and z6s in there and i just could not like i just could never pay for the rockets and if i put a rocket out then whoever got it just died and it just felt awful so i just try to trim down the list 
and uh, more so my strategy was just actually just killing Ankar first because what Phasma needs to do to be able to win the game is to get upgrades on the table, keep them on the table, and just ramp out for those big like 10 damage turns where you're just rerolling like four times to be able to get the big damage. So I have to get to that place to be able to even think about winning the game and therefore I took it on. I'm just going to lower my overall deck cost a little bit. Still have some three costs in there if I need them because I did was still running the Riot Batons but then actually mostly going for Ankar first. In addition to that, you had mentioned, uh, you know, in some of the talks after the Gen Con tournament that uh, you felt that you had a pretty good matchup against Bomaz. Is that, again, also with the uh, just the sabotage, or what else thinks you put you over the top there? The sabotage definitely helped. Me kind of learning that I should just always pick their battlefield, regardless of like whether it's the emperor's throne room it's like it feels kind of bad given the throne room but honestly what i need to do is i need as fast i need to race them like i need to kill a character before they kill all my characters i need to get guns out i need to go fast i need to kill somebody actually one of one of my best matches most interesting matches that happened was when one of the cash tournaments i was placing against the pomas and they hit thermal ewing round one uh round two they I think I might have guardian something, and then they hit the other thermal with the claim, and both my guardians are dead. Bo has five damage on him. Phasma has three upgrades on her, but he had claimed, and I just kept rerolling five times basically, and I killed Poe round two. So I'm sitting there with Phasma with six damage on her. My whole team has been destroyed by the area damage, but I still came back and won the game because Poe died on turn two. And Moz was able to do nothing. I had salvage stands out, so I was able to keep the resources down so Moz can never actually put a real upgrade out. And I'll say salvage stand is probably the other card that's just absolutely amazing. If salvage stand does not exist, I don't think Phasma would really be able to compete with anything in this top field as well as it does. Nice, very nice. Uh, I guess we can move on to the top 16. Uh, What place did you get into uh, in the rankings there? I was the eighth seed, I think. Yeah, I was seed eight, so I played number nine, which was a Pomaz deck. But it was a Pomaz deck running Frozen Waste and a lot of control cards. It was running Lone Operative for like heals and melee damage to be able to remove uh, Hunker Downs. It was remove. It was running uh, a one second chance, and the guy even told me he didn't even use second chance the whole the whole tournament. He used it twice against me <laughs> in one game with uh, Sabotage or Scavenge, and uh, that was one where I had killed. I got Poe dead pretty early. I had Phasma sitting at one health and two shields for, like, the entire last half of the game, and it was basically just grinding out damage against Maz with a bunch of healing stuff, but never really... She never really got any good damage upgrades out. And then the second round... Second game of that match, I was able to kill Maz even faster, and she was dead by mid-turn two, or round two, and then, like, Phasma's pretty good at being able to control Poe. Um, I think he was running retreats... Or, no, I think he was just running hyperspace jump. But I will say, retreat is the one card that really makes the matchup versus Pomaz awful for Phasma. If they get a retreat off on round one or two, and you can't like salvage stand the resources down so they can't do that, it is basically that that can win them the game right there. Just that one move. Luckily, in the ones that I won against Pomaz, that did not happen. They got a few hyperspace jumps off, but not at times that really, really. It rolled more as a defensive one than it was for anything to keep them rolling. So I like the I, I the the games versus Pomaz in the top sixteen. I'd say I won by quite a bit, even though Phasma only had one health left. The fact that she was still alive meant that it just they didn't have much of a chance. And then in the top eight, I fought pretty much the only other unique deck that was left in the in the thing, and that was uh, a FN Elite Kylo and a Stormtrooper. And this deck was pretty cool because I feel like it got a lot had a lot of tools that could do really well against some of the other top meta decks. Uh, you have Kylo's ability, which is really good against like the decks running a lot of two and three costs, or Poe Maz running some four and five cost stuff. Uh, it was running holocrons, and it was only running like eight weapons at most, I think, just kind of like your standard redeploys. And I don't even remember; I don't even think it had rocket launchers. So it was really more about like sticking weapons on FN, and like it was doing like weapons on FN, holocron on Kylo, just kind of making two characters these huge threats and having two best defenses to be able to just sack that stormtrooper. And he was even running uh, the price of failure to be able to just one of those two big threats dies. You can stand the other one up and keep going. It was a pretty good matchup for Phasma though, because Phasma, th- there's a lot of paid sides in those dice and the non-paid sides are the low impact sides. So the idea was just still keep control of his money really hard. They can pay for his pay sides. Don't guardian those. And 
he never really is able to ramp a whole lot. He, the first game, he got a lot of Holocron stuff out. Well, he put two Holocrons out. I think he only ever got a Force throw out, but I had killed Kylo pretty shortly after that happened. In the second game, I killed Kylo first as well, but I was able to... Friends in low places to remove the uh, price of failure out of his hand right one action before he was ready to play it. So and that was that was kind of brutal because that was his one way back into the game. But overall, I think that was a pretty good matchup for Phasma. Any deck that like tends to play fair with a like damage like that is a lot easier for Phasma than stuff like Pomas and the Rainbow or the Funk Car where they can just start throwing damage at you that you have no chance of mitigating. And then in the the top four, they're wasn't a whole lot to say. It was basically just a beatdown. I killed Bala really late in the first game. I think I actually ended up killing Bala the Night Sister at the same turn, but not after he had already like reactivated Bala like once or twice already on my at least on my Stormtrooper. Um, he just he was just rolling pretty well and got a lot of good stuff and was rolling really far ahead of me in the damage. I just I wasn't put enough out enough damage. And I, I, I don't know. There, 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 it was one of those games where like, you're playing against FN and you're like, yep, there's not a whole lot I could have done this game. If, if you're playing against a Vader deck, you're playing against Pomaz, you're playing against anything else, if, if the deck does that to you, it doesn't really matter. That, that's how you, that, that'll just win any game versus almost any matchup. And that just kind of happened. And it kind of happened two games in a row. And it felt kind of bad, but I, I don't think Phasm is actually that good of a matchup versus the Rainbow FN, the Rainbow FN deck there. And which uh, which uh, pilot were you playing against in the in the top? Four? Uh, that was Mike, who was Bobby Sapphire from the the Hyperloops. Was right. in the top four. Cool. So uh, do you fin- I guess you finished out the the whole top sixteen in two games on each uh, each match. Yep, two games yep. in the top sixteen and the top eight, and lost two in the top four. So my my only losses that that day were for in the main event were to FN decks though, which makes sense. Yeah. Maybe uh, a little makes it a little dangerous to run uh, Phasma to anybody going to Nova because you know with the uh, the Rainbow FN deck, even though they're not the Hyperloops guys haven't actually put out the deck list yet uh, and probably won't until after Nova, uh, you can imagine that there, that will be a pretty big showing uh, at this tournament after how it's done so far in the uh, the TTS tournaments and in the uh, in Gen Con in general. So uh, yeah, I mean if you're gonna if you're gonna take Phasma, you better have some something that uh can handle the uh the rainbow f index is there anything that you can think of after playing the games uh you know and, and seeing it play out against those two uh that could have maybe been beneficial to include in your deck for that matchup i hadn't thought about it too much i know uh one guy either commented on facebook or on the database uh or something like that so someone had had mentioned uh one, one idea they had was uh like what about putting uh lying in wait in the deck and you know that that might not actually be that awful of a tech card which is lying in wait if in case you don't know which is not very popular is a one cost yellow event that says force your opponent to discard cards down to the amount that you have in hand so you're sitting on one resource you roll out you keep re-rolling they boundless you lie in wait their whole turn is over then like that that could be an amazing counterplay. I don't know how often you'd ever actually be able to do that, but it it, it does sound like a pretty cool card to be able to use against FN decks. At least it's something to try out and testing. Yeah, but I, I don't know that I would really say you should try to play Phasma against in a really heavy run of those Rainbow FN metas because it's just kind of a faster, more deadly deck than Phasma is or, or can deal with on average. Certainly, you can win. You can you can win versus almost any deck, but it's just that if it hits everything it needs to, there's there's not much you can do. You just kind of got to pray. And I'll say I did I did not test a ton versus Rainbow. I not really played much Rainbow myself, which is part of why I didn't pick Rainbow to play, even though it's probably arguably the best deck in the set by now, I think we could probably say. But I mean I didn't have the reps with Rainbow, and honestly I didn't want to play a mirror match with that Rainbow. That that's just sounds awful, because it's just who who gets the right cards, who gets the right things. I I really do like the Phasma matchup for Rainbow. I didn't get, actually get any, but I really like it because there's there's always kind of this mind game of like, well, are you, are you gonna Guardian? Or am I gonna roll out and then you're gonna Guardian? Am I gonna pass? Are we gonna both gonna pass? Like there's there's some just weird stuff that can happen with with Phasma and matchups when you have two people with two guardians out there all right so something i'd like to hear a little bit more about that wasn't really covered by anyone in particular was you know what was going on with destiny outside of the major tournament we 
we heard that there was some demo tables. You guys were saying there was some cash events. Like what else were you seeing at Gen Con? Because we know FFG was heavily promoting L5R. You know, they've they've been advertising and marketing that for two years and their launch was this Gen Con. But like what was going on specifically with Destiny during the convention? It felt like nothing was happening with Destiny. It felt like it was extremely overlooked. It was like, you know, we had a uh about a drought of like three weeks of no articles that's that's pretty much what gen con felt like too you're like oh oh there's no promos you just have the demos of the original starters oh okay i mean the the best thing that was not the main tournament was just there were other cash events or win a box events that were at least something else to do for it but in terms of what fantasy flight offered there was there's nothing Unless you sumped something else that I didn't, Jay. Yeah, I can't really report anything else that they were doing. I mean, a lot of people were hoping to see some spoilers, which the panel seemed kind of neat. I wasn't able to make that because I was in the throes of the L5R events. But really, as far as Destiny representation, like outside of entering the event and getting the Vader promo, there really wasn't much else you could like find or get excited about, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, they just had the uh, the Cad Bane uh, from the pack that they opened out of the box that they had in the display case that we saw pictures of uh, prior to you know doors opening uh, for the general public. You know, it it, uh, it really sparked a lot of interest uh, that night. You know, is Empire at War going to be available for sale that day or not? You know, that was kind of quickly shot down. You know. Uh, our friends over at uh, Jedi uh, Trials, you know, said that, you know, hey, we got an email saying that it wasn't going to be, you know, the spoilers were going out to the various uh, outlets and they didn't want to uh, step on everybody's toes, I guess was the, you know, the what they put out. But personally, I think they wanted to concentrate a little bit more on the L5R launch, which was extremely successful from what, you know, all reports that we got out of there. I mean, they hell they had a 700 person tournament for uh, the first uh, the first tournament there. So you know they probably just had to pack a lot of L5R and just had to be you know you know judicious with what they what else they brought along with them. So uh, I mean the panel you know you had you know Lucas talking about that the release date was going to be uh, very 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 soon uh which actually came out uh today as the uh the 14th of september and then the you know they had a fan with uh, a couple of cards for empire war but other than that i think that was pretty much all they really talked about for it you know i'm honestly a little surprised we didn't hear anything about the the next set after empire war because if you think look at it like time wise if they were actually trying to release something by the end of the year still for the, like the they said like the no base set would be in quarter four i thought and if they did that, then it would line up about when they announced uh, Empire at War at Celebration, which is like just before Spirit of Rebellion dropped. So I was a little surprised we didn't get to see that. But Yeah, I mean, with the sem- uh, September release, a mid-September release for Empire at War, I mean, it, it puts it pretty... I don't. I don't feel that they would be able to put out anything by the end of the year for for set four. Personally, uh, that puts it at just uh, three and a half months uh, left of the year. Could they really get another set in there with uh, you know Christmas coming around the corner? I mean, it'd be great to hit right at Christmas. That would hit uh, you know new packs from set four and everybody's stocking. That would be great. But we'll see what they uh, what they have in mind. So one other thing that happened at Gen Con, I don't know who did it, but. So Lucas, game two of the main tournament, comes up to me. I'm in the middle of my game. He's got two deck lists. They both have my name on it. One of them is not my deck list. It's like emo kids, and it has a made-up email that's like Obi-Wan at yahoo.com, and like like Obi, my last name. So it was, it was kind of silly. And it's like, <laughs> what is this? So if somebody out there is trolling me, that was pretty good. <laughs> But I'd like to know who it is sometime, just to give you a little high five or something. That was pretty fun. Um, <laughs> and then in, then in the top 16, yeah, they're like, are we going to get him? We're going to make him, get him disqualified for not playing the right deck. But uh, in the top 16, like when they were giving out the deck list to for everybody to look at, uh, they pulled out they pulled out the troll one and handed it to my opponent. And that was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, uh yeah, you might not want to look at that because that, that ain't going to help be helpful. And then he, he just looked through my deck itself, but then they found the other one later. But that, that was just a little silly story. I, I don't know how it happened or who did it, but it was pretty funny. 
All right. So it sounds like Gen Con was a lot of fun. Nova is right around the corner. Rick is going to be there. There's going to be a panel and he's going to be discussing some uh, history about Destiny and things of that nature. So we're really excited to send him out and, you know, help support, you know, the second biggest event that's going to be happening out in, you know, America for Destiny. But today we got some, well, today we got a lot of spoilers for both Blue Hero and Villain decks. And we're going to talk about all of those because there's some really neat neat cards and i'm i'm probably going to consider building some hero decks now with some of these so the first card i maybe maybe i didn't say i will i said maybe (laughs) Uh, obviously my go-to villain deck is uncar thrawn don't get me wrong i'm a villain at heart but we got Ahsoka Tano, and she is my favorite non-film character just because she's, in my opinion, really well written and a very interesting character because she's kind of like Anakin's conscience. So it was always interesting to see her and him in Clone Wars like playing off of each other. So we have her card. She is a 13, 17 point, 11 health character. She clocks in with two melee damage, two melee damage. One discard, one shield, one resource, one blank, and her effect is after you activate this character the first time each round, you may spend resources equal to the number of dice you just rolled to ready her. So if you run her elite and you have one upgrade, you would have to pay three resources to ready her. You know, you could max out at five dice. So, you know, potentially if you have five resources, you could pay five to ready her. But she's just a lot of really good things. She's a great point cost. I think for her health and her effect. The best thing realistically is she's got two two melee sides with no pay to resolve. And that's pretty big for hero right now is a lot of characters you see like a two a plus two modified side and then like a three for one or something where you know some of their dice are usable but you either have to have a resource or you have to have a base damage side ahsoka just comes out swinging and she doesn't need any help she can do it by herself and i think that's really strong the discard is nice i like discard I think it's a very powerful effect because most people will see that discard and think, okay, they're going to re-roll it and try and go for damage, but you can use that against your opponent. Shield is pretty stock and the resource is pretty stock. It's just really interesting that Ahsoka can roll out up to twice per turn without using any kind of special effects from cards. And that's, I mean, like if she's loaded up and you just happen to have a lot of money, that can be pretty devastating. But early game, it's also pretty scary because you can roll out, potentially get four damage off of her, pay two res. I mean, you get to see what she rolls. So upon activation, you roll her out, say you see four damage, then you can decide, sure, I'm going to pay two resources to ready her, resolve those two dice, and then swing out again. You could potentially get eight damage out of her for two resources, which is extremely efficient, in my opinion. Yeah, I don't know how often this will actually be able to trigger you know especially in the late game uh if you're loading her up with weapons or or upgrades or whatever uh one of the funniest things i saw on there uh mark chan on the uh, star wars destiny facebook group uh showed her with uh two thermal paints on her at a uh, at a single die so that uh every time she activates deal one damage to the uh the opponent uh, opponent's characters and then ready her again for one resource and do it again that that's pretty funny <laughs> if you're uh if you can happen to get two of them on her but yeah, it, uh, the ability to just sit there and if you don't have anything to spend your resources on, uh, just to be able to reactivate a character, which is one of the most powerful things you can be doing uh, in Destiny, uh, seems really good, especially at that point cost of thirteen seventeen. The one thing that's weird is that she's legendary and we've already seen Mace and he's legendary. That's three legendary because we have then we have Master of the Council. That's three legendaries for blue and villain has the same thing. I don't know. Is there is there a reason why they might have done that for this set that anyone can think of there in previous sets they have some neutral legendaries in a color and those might be theoretically non-existent in empire war i mean lucas has said constantly in multiple interviews across the board that you know they've always had this rule of you know there's 24 characters and you know so many legendaries and here and there but there's going to be sets coming out that break those where you might have one extra villain or one extra hero or you know the legends are in different denominations so it is possible that you know there won't be as many specifically neutral cards but there will be focused like you know there's three villain legendaries there's three hero legendaries so potentially less neutrals are coming out of the set that everyone has access to and actually it's way better for the legendaries to be characters than upgrades because it's way more expensive for upgrades if you ever want to have more than two of them but you should never need more than two characters 
The thing that stops me from getting excited about this card is that the decision point of doing the reactivation is immediately after activating her. So you roll her out, and then depending on what you roll, you have to decide immediately, do you want to pay however many resources that is. She's also slightly counterintuitive to the issues that Blue Hero already has, which is money. It's strange that, like, you know, she's your blue character, and potentially you'd want to run force speed, but now that force speed is, like, costing you money? if you want to do her effect i mean potentially the way i would consider playing her is possibly rolling her out readying her resolving what you can then slapping on you know for speed or possibly other options but yeah it's just really tricky and like paying for the reroll and potentially maybe only resolving like getting a resource back doesn't feel super good it's kind of like going through the motions i don't know i want to i want to see what people do with her i'm not convinced she's bad but i just think that having to decide that quickly in the turn is incredibly brutal and resources are already tight and even beyond things like getting imperial inspection and whatnot or salvage stand more accurately it's just really hard to think how often you would use this ability as opposed to playing another blue character that might do something more reliably so the next card we have is shoto lightsaber it's a neutral blue upgrade weapon it costs two it has one melee side a plus one melee side a plus two melee side a shield a resource and a blank and it states after you activate attached character if it has another blue weapon you may give it one shield or remove one shield from a character I find this weapon to be pretty solid, um, almost entirely based on its cost. Uh, I mean, it costs two. It's got three reasonable melee sides. The shield is nice for hero for a lot of the effects that they care about. It does make money, you know, has the usual miss, but that's nothing to hold against it. It's just a, again, it's just sort of a safe, reliable option. And on top of that, like, even if this card didn't have an ability, I still think it would be pretty decent. So it's got an interesting conditional of another blue weapon, but generating a free shield, obviously there's characters that care about that. And even if if we're in the you know still in the vibra knife meta uh shields still have their uses so i think this card's really good all around yeah i think it's funny that every time uh a new set's about to drop there's something in there that makes me really want to play qui-gon again uh and this seems really good on him uh you know having two on them guarantees you're going to get a ping every turn no matter if they can deal with those shields or not you know there's obviously quick to build up for repost and other things like that this is uh you know with the base melee side uh it's already better than makashi training that sees a lot of play in there as far as the dice sides go uh i mean its ability is still pretty relevant uh being able to remove melee sides on the makashi training but yeah all around i think this is definitely one of the best uh blue weapons i mean it it's got some uh competition with like kylo's but kylo's being at three cost where this is at two uh just kind of edges it out there like jay was saying this cost is it's it's really good for the cost yeah the scary thing is if you have both shoto lightsabers on qui-gon they trigger each other yeah so you can get two damage and then you can use the die or you can just get rid of two shields i mean like the fact that two of these on qui-gon is just like it's free damage is bonkers <laughs> I, I like the, the card. There's not much more to say. I think it's a very strong toolbox for any deck that uses it. Villains can definitely put it to good use, but it's really nice to see heroes have some options that are cost effective, really good synergy. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with this card realistically, even without the effect. Like the die phases are great. They give you all the things you want and it's just icing on the cake. I mean, it's, it's also the first blue two cost weapon which really helps out for some of the other cards we're going to see here and uh some other things that's really nice for hero it's another card that's really great with guard and it's another thing that can help trigger destiny to be able to use its die for that something you can't do with the vibra knife right and it works really well with some of the cards people want to play but haven't such as your padawans 
being able to put this down for one. If you're running two Padawans, having both of these out, I mean, that's really good, I think. So I like where this is going. I, I've always wanted to play Hero. It's just they're just not as powerful as villains in the way I want to play. And we're finally seeing cards that allow me to allow my play style to kind of show up and do funny, janky things. And I'm excited about that. All right, so next up we got Lightsaber Pull. It's a zero-cost neutral blue event. Spot a blue character, search your deck for a blue weapon, reveal it, add it to your hand, and shuffle your deck. So yeah, there's not a lot of uh, targets for it yet, uh, including what was spoiled today. Uh, here, uh, Villain has a couple more uh, than Hero does, uh, but obviously Shoto is uh, going to be pretty good for this. Um, you know, it, it, it lets you get a weapon if you really want a weapon, but I don't think anything that blue is doing right now really needs to have a blue weapon early on to be able to to kind of add this as the the third and fourth copy of that weapon that you need to make sure that you're going to see every every game or early every game what do y'all think so when i see this card the first thing that made me laugh was i thought of lightsaber pulling a light bow beyond that uh so being able to just hit the ground running get a decent upgrade on your character preferably the shoto lightsaber and start swinging is pretty good you know it's sort of like hand fixy if you're trying to go the adro route like this could be good and that's potentially like emo kids and the like you know not sure yet but it's interesting how it it's something you can mulligan through to help ensure that again you like get the upgrade you're looking for whether it be the upgrade to start with or the upgrade to overwrite into later game uh it just kind of makes your deck slightly more consistent but do keep in mind that a lot of mill decks that have been hovering around you know it's getting closer to the break point where mill is finally going to be able to sort of end that turn sooner which has basically been its issue where if mill could sustain or get one turn further it would turn around a lot of its uh pressure and ability to control the game and using a card like this only helps them so do bear that in mind but obviously this is a pretty much an aggro card in most cases so you're burning through your deck anyway i like this card it's exactly what you want out of a tutor it targets what you need but it's not you could pull out whatever you want and i think that's good i think the cost is very fair i do find it interesting and a lot of people have brought this up a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, Lucas specifically stated they will not have any tutors in the game, which I didn't like because I'm from a magic background and I like tutors. So I, I am intrigued that this exists because I just removed it from my head that I was I was never going to be able to tutor anything out ever. I'd have to mulligan or get it out some other way. So seeing this does make me happy because I like reliable decks. I like consistency and having a 28 card deck in my head is good, regardless of if I'm facing off against mill because hopefully i can use this to get the card i need to kill the mill decks faster than they can mill me i'm just really happy it exists because if they're going to have tutors for blue weapons potentially you might have tutors for red weapons or you know events or whatever they can you know create and design so i think this is a really interesting space for destiny and whether it's good or bad we'll see but i do like the fact that tutors are now a part of the game so next card is kane and jerris one of the main Jedi from Star Wars Rebels. He's a 10 health, 10 13 cost. He's got a 1 range side, a 2 melee side, a 1 focus, a 1 disrupt, a 1 resource, and a blank. Uh, and he has the ability that says, before you take an action, you may resolve one of this die. So you may resolve one of his character dice before taking any action in the game. There are some really cool interactions with this, such as, like, I want to play this card, and I don't have a resource. I'm going to take my resource that's showing on this Kanan die, and then I can play my card. Or you want to disrupt your opponent and then be able to do something else to be it. Like, maybe you want to roll, up your other, roll, roll out your other character, but disrupt them first before they can hit you with removal. Or you want to focus a die and then actually resolve it. That's also really powerful. 
aside from like those really niche situations though the rest of the card is just kind of like a meh fairer version of ray like he kind of gets you a little bit ahead he can kind of like step around removal a little bit by doing some of his stuff he can give you a little edge here and there but he's not really spectacular he has a 10 13 cost which is something that hero does not have at all i don't know it, it, i don't know what, where he's gonna fit in where ray doesn't and that i think that's the biggest problem with kanan right now is that he, he doesn't fill the void that that he needs to yeah i agree that he suffers from the issue where in a vacuum i think he's a really really well designed card and i think his ability is really cool and does create uh interesting situations that said i have to agree with nick that i don't honestly think he's super playable right now which is unfortunate because i think he again is a very well designed card and would be fun to play but i don't think his effect is good enough he's just this very amusing hybrid of ray and maz i like his ability on this die specifically in the mixed damage uh uh, sweet here you know it's it's exactly what you'd want to do when you're when you have range sides and you have melee sides uh that you have rolled out uh you get to choose so say you roll him and uh and uh Chirut out um and you have modified sides and a base side for your melee but you're sitting with this one range side on there uh you can then you know resolve that one range die and then get also get out your uh your melee with the modified side uh, or vice versa if it's ranged or or and a modified range side um so i think this action is actually perfect for a mixed uh damage blue deck which also leads in the force misdirection being incredibly good uh, with them. So, you know, other than like the focus being its main uh, draw there, you know, being able to, to, you know, pick and choose and resolve multiple types of damage uh, die if they, you know, lined out that way uh, makes him a little bit better in race uh, aspect. I mean, you got to admit, even though it's mixed damage, that die face or those die sides are 10 times better than Ray's sides are. Uh, unfortunately, Ray's ability is one of the best in the game. So, uh, you know, he, he does kind of fight for that spot if I'm just picking a blue character that I want to run with, you know, but you know, if you're building your deck around those mixed damage sides or being able to take advantage of his ability, I think he does have a spot. And he might be a decent partner for some of the the 20 point heroes like Obi Wan and uh, Luke. Just like he he might fit in fairly well there as an alternative to Ray. And I think you made a good point with Force Misdirection. Actually, having a base damage range damage side on your character die could be absolutely huge for for some of your matchups. But being able to like use the focus into like a Luke 3, and then my ally is a force. That's pretty sweet. All right, so uh, next up we have at peace, uh, two resource cost, uh, hero event, uh, which states turn each die that has one or more blanks to a side showing a blank. So that's going to be yours and your opponents that are in the pool. Uh, so everything just goes to a blank. Uh, immediately what shot out to me for this is if you uh, resolve a force speed special, uh, play at peace, uh, spend one more on, again, the force misdirection to just completely get rid of all your opponent's dice that are on the table. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that seems like the best uh, thing for it. But also, you know, looking back at, you know, Hero Mill with uh, Patience, you know, this this then turns into a really good defensive card for you to, you know, blank them out. They got a discard to reroll like you're wanting them to do anyway. You don't care what your sides are, so you're just going to remove them for Patience anyway. I, I really like this card. I wish it wasn't two resources, but with that ability, uh, it's pretty powerful there. Um, obviously, it's not by itself. Uh, going to be any hard removal there but you know it's it's still uh, doing the thing that you want it to do I had to read this card like four times when it came out today because I was just like I don't understand what this does and then when the light bulb clicked I was like oh my gosh this effect is so good the only problem is the game is faster than the effect is useful so like the ratio of usefulness to viability is like unfortunately not as good because so many decks right now are all about cheating the core mechanics of the game you know Pomaz, you roll out your dice, focus, resolve them. 
okay, well, then there's nothing to remove or to blank out. You know, FN is going to roll out his stuff and then resolve it. And then there's, once again, nothing to blank out. So I like the card, and I feel like if the meta does become slower, like FFG and Lucas are trying to create, this has more viability. But like right now, in the state of the game, there's not a lot of decks where you can actually capitalize off of blanking out an efficient number of dice versus the resources you've spent as opposed to actually using like a hard control card i think it'd be pretty good against phasma still because you're oftentimes trying to roll up to a big board especially if you know but that's usually only if you know they don't have resources so. yeah but nobody plays phasma out here <laughs> <laughs> that's true i mean any any big gun deck but if, if you if you know it too you just play around it and just resolve your dice faster so it's you you have a huge bias, sir, for Phasma, and I respect it, but... <laughs> Dude, Phasma can beat anything. Sometimes. <laughs> Uh-oh. So, yeah, I was going to say, uh, some, some days. <laughs> All right, so the next card is No Surrender. If anyone knows who this character is on the art, I'd love to know, because he looks really awesome, kind of like a ninja Isn't samurai. Like eighth brother or something like that? I'm not entirely sure. I haven't watched a lot of Rebels. Fifth brother. Okay. Fifth brother. It's one okay. of the brothers. <laughs> so yeah, his artwork is just really awesome. So no surrender is a zero cost neutral blue common. It's an event that states re-roll one of your blue character dice showing a blank. Then you may resolve it. I like this card for so many things, especially Palpatine. I really, really, really want Palpatine to like be a thing in this next meta because I just like him a lot. And the keywords are perfect because he's a blue character. You reroll his die and then you resolve it, which triggers his effect. I mean, there's not really a downside to it other than if you're running like mixed colors or rainbow decks, this is so inefficient and unlikely to be useful. You, you probably won't use it. But if you're running, you know, a very blue heavy deck or a mono blue or I mean, even like a Vader Raider, things that have blanks, being able to mitigate that and resolve within the same action is really, really powerful because the older version of this card from like Awakening would have said just re-roll and that's not great because people are either going to outplay you or remove the die being able to re-roll and resolve inside of one card effect is great i think yeah and the fact that it doesn't since so you forced to resolve it you may resolve it so that yeah that's cool uh one one good card to uh, play this with is manipulate uh which turns one of your die to a blank to turn one of your opponent's die to a blank uh, and then being able to uh re-roll that uh, to resolve it again is good. Again, it's it's one die that you're re-rolling that has to be a blue character die. So outside of mono blue, it's kind of inefficient there, but still pretty cool. Awesome art. So next one is Training Remote. This is a one cost support that has, it's kind of like Lure Power. It has a plus one, a plus one, a plus one, a plus two for a resource and two blanks. And these are plus t- ones that are generic, just like Lure Power. So they, they can modify anything on a blue character character die so that is the one stipulation they're very much tied to the blue characters not the blue upgrades so there's a little bit of nuance to it but uh i don't know i think this card's pretty cool i think this might be as long as you're okay being slower in a in a round like this card's probably better than lure power because it's not tied to a specific character it only costs one and you can have two of them out there and still get a pretty good effect i don't know i like this card i think it'll see some play in mono blue hero I think it's kind of neat and interesting that this card is a support and not an upgrade. Like, it, it, it makes sense in function, but in terms of, you know, like, what kind of removal hits it and, like, how versatile it is is really interesting. Yeah, I like the fact that early game you could drop two of these and then, you know, going back to Ahsoka, say you roll her out and she's elite. So you could max out at six damage because you don't have resources to pay for the two for one unless you have some way to do that. But it's just really interesting that you have the capacity to bolster your blue character dice and it comes at the cost of slowing your deck down pretty pretty slow so your efficiency is there and your resource curve is extremely low which is great but the counterbalance to that is you're not going to be able to just roll and swing quickly you're going to have to roll a character and then roll out one or two training remotes just to see if you get anything that's even usable because if you don't have any money you essentially have a 50 percent blank so i like the way ffg has created this fairness because if this goes a one drop upgrade weapon this would be ridiculously under and overpowered but it's not and i like that i like the fact that they're thinking about their design 
design space and their balancing. I think what's also notable, like effects like this are really nice for those dice sides that don't usually have more than a one. So you see like discard or resource and you get a plus one on that. That's that's really nice. Like being able to discard two from an opponent is, I know ah- Ahsoka has a discard side that that would be worth resolving two discard on your opponent or getting two resources back from of that one die and the trainee remote is, is great yeah you know to take that a step further you know making focus sides one focus on like luke into a two focus for one resource or a three focus for one resource that just gets into ridiculous levels now but yeah uh you know it's uh ray decks a lot of times have a tendency to go too fast so you could easily slot this in here and still not be slowing yourself down too much i don't know of any time that your opponent would get rid of this die with mitigation (laughs) so you know rolling that out first is always a safe play and then seeing what you get into and and going from there so i don't know if i would run it but you know it, the the opportunity cost of you know this being a support and slowing you down i don't think is too detrimental to uh to hero blue next up we have the grand inquisitor sith loyalist he's a blue villain character 12 health 1419 cost two melee three melee for a resource two focus one resource a special and a miss the special reads remove a character die showing a blank and then deal two damage to that character He has a lot of cool options and interactions with cards like Force Speed, where if you Force Speed and your old is too focused, you could do a lot of nasty things. Uh, His special is pretty dirty. Again, with Force Speed taking the extra actions, you could use cards like Manipulate to blank a character die and then blow it up. Uh, resolving both uh he's very versatile and interacts with a lot of things that villain blue likes to do and has a nice meaty 12 health so overall i'm not sure he's gonna scream into the competitive scene as we see him right now but i think his overall design is excellent and he allows a lot of different avenues to do cool stuff interacting with a lot of things villain does so i'm eager to see more i think he has a good pairing with the the seventh sister as well being able to run her at 11 and have that fourth die with the the droid out right away this does kind of circle back to what you were saying earlier about there's multiple characters at legendary status and and realistically you're not going to pair ahsoka with mace but you can pair two grand inquisitor die with one sister die and i i don't know i mean He's in this weird space where he has all of the things you really want. Like, his damage is high. He's He's got the Darth Vader damage, so the two and the three, but you have to pay one resource. He does have two focus, which is really, really good. I can't even deny that. Especially for villain, which typically does not have any like two focuses yeah that's what i found to be most interesting is between him and that id9 droid you've got three focus online because if if you run him with the seventh sister but that's the crazy thing is like we haven't seen a villain deck with focus and she is built to work and synergize well with him which means you have a villain deck with high damage and high focus potential which is kind of scary if you think about it so i understand that he has to have that three for one side because otherwise he could just go ham pretty easily and i once again i really like the fact that you can tell the designers are really really thinking about the interactions with these characters and the dice and the cards so they just don't go bonkers the special is obviously Obviously a one in six chance so it is situational on two fronts one you have to have the special die rolled out and two your well your opponent realistically should have the blank because you don't want to target your own characters eat their die and ping them for two unless there's some other special effect that somehow does something where you kill a character but he's he's really well kitted i like his 12 health i like his die faces but kind of like jay was saying i don't know where he fits at this current point and I'm so glad they put that one resource on the three melee side because, like y'all were saying, you hadn't seen a lot of focus in the uh, in the villain blue because villain blue hasn't needed a lot of it. Things like force strike out there, so you know, giving him a native two focus, but kind of limiting uh his uh his most uh damaging uh damage side with that one resource so that it's less uh beneficial for for uh force strike to be uh to be played on it uh helps out a lot there and then in turn allows him to move the point cost down a little bit uh from you know 
what he would be before, you know, he would definitely be a 20 cost character, you know, out of Awakenings or something like that. But, but they seem to be going down a little bit on the, uh, the character costs. So, you know, the die sides have to reflect that as well, or else you're just going to have incredible power creep that won't be sustainable once you get six sets into the, uh, into the game. So yeah, it, overall, I like him. Uh, very, very cool. His art, uh, looks like he's doing a force push, which works really well with with what uh, his special does here. So yeah, all in all, I like him. Is he better than Vader? Absolutely not, but uh, he is uh, he is pretty good. All right, so next up we have a target for lightsaber pull, the Grand Inquisitor's lightsaber. I really, really like the design of this saber in the TV show. We'll talk about the card, but like, it's just really cool that like he kind of has like the Darth Maul thing, but he can like start to rotate it and stab you or cut you into pieces. Like, it's such a versatile tool in the show, and I also feel like it's a very versatile tool in the game. So this is another legendary weapon. It is a four resource villain only upgrade weapon, so it's pretty. pretty pricey this has three melee three for one melee plus three modified side melee it's pretty good two shields one special and a blank the card has a stipulation of blue character only and then the special effect states turn a character die to a side showing a blank reroll this die instead of removing it from your pool so yeah this is a monster of a card for damage 50% of this die deals three damage. Now, of course, one of them is free damage. One of them is three for one. And one of them is a modified side. But still, no joke. Two shields, sure, whatever. The special, very good, because this is a lot less situational than what you have to do if you're running out that Inquisitor. But it does have extremely strong synergy with him, because if you have special on this, special on Inquisitor, you can use the the lightsaber to blank out one of their die, reroll the lightsaber. Then you can use the special on the Inquisitor to remove that die and deal two damage to the character you just blanked out. So it's really good. However, and this is what I think is going to make this card not as playable as we'd really like it to be, is it costs four resources. That is a ton of money. That That is just so much money that blue villain just really doesn't have the capacity to build. And you, the only really, really reliable way to get that out is you're going to have to run an uncard deck because you can't really use this with FN because he's not blue. So I don't know of a really strong combination that has uncard yellow with a blue character where you'd actually want to run this as opposed to something else, especially Kylo's lightsaber. So I don't know. What do you guys think? I have to disagree with you there in that, you know, here a uh, villain blue has money problems. You know, most of the time they're holocroning, not paying for upgrades. So what else are they paying their uh, resources on other than, you know, doing damage mitigation and whatever uh you know there's plenty of times where decks that you don't think should be able to get off a uh, rise again will do very early in the game um so a four cost uh villain uh upgrade in blue isn't that far out of the realm of possibilities at the very least uh you know if you put a up a ability off of a holocron you can overwrite it to uh generally uh save you three resources for this which is probably better than whatever you have on there uh as opposed to maybe a force lightning or a, a something along those lines. But yeah, four is not ridiculously cost prohibitive in villain blue. Uh, so yeah, it, it's it's definitely worth slotting in there uh, if you think you have any chance of playing it in there, which you know you should if you're hologrounding. I really like the special on that because you don't even actually have to have a character die to it doesn't it's not a then effect so if if all the character dies are out of the pool and you roll that that's just a free reroll so it 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 has a blank shields three damage sides and a free reroll basically that's that's pretty interesting you don't see much along the lines that lets you do that i like the fact that say if you're playing this on the inquisitor himself uh, you notice the Inquisitor has a three for one side, so he's not necessarily a four strike candidate. But if you can get this turned on, you can four strike this die, which to me uh, is a big plus on using this. I think 
this is a pretty packed weapon just has a lot of huge numbers and again you can upgrade into it you can lightsaber pull into it when you're ready for it and it's a house uh it's definitely one of the higher side weapons in the game it almost gets to the point where it's you have to ask yourself is it necessary compared to some of the other ones but it's got some removal it's got some defense and it's got three threes on it it's hard to be upset about i wouldn't be surprised if this is played Quill and Voss is our next card. He has 11 health. His cost is 12, 15. Villain. His die sides are 2 melee plus 2 melee. A discard. Resource. Special. And a blank. And his special reads. Deal damage to an opponent's character equal to the number of cards in your hand more than the number of cards in that opponent's hand. He's another one of those middle of the pack characters like in the Ahsoka range and the Dooku range. Sort of like... His point cost is a little heavy to try and get him to do what he wants. And also a character where if you want to resolve around a special, you got to definitely roll the special side. It's not an activation or any other sort of triggered effect. So he's a little all over the place for my tastes. It is neat that he does have two melee sides for the purposes of you would probably want to run cards like Close Quarters Assault in this deck and try and discard them out and using the discard side and just different little tricks to try and make his special worthwhile but i'm not honestly certain uh there's a deck that screams play me or puts it all together granted there's a ton of cards we haven't seen yet but i look at this character and it's one of those like i just kind of go okay sure i think it's a uh finally a good reason to run emperor's favor in your deck you know, it's to get that increase your hand size by one so that you guarantee that that special side is going to at least do one point of damage, most likely uh, more. Uh, but, you know, playing mediocre cards doesn't really scream play me, right? So, yeah, I like him. I like his design. I like his point cost. Uh, 11 health uh, to even out uh, Ventress a little bit uh, that they pair up real nicely with. So all in all, I think he's cool. Took me a double take to realize he was villain um, just because I haven't really dug too deep into uh, Quinlan Voss, uh, what do they call it, Legends lore. So I had to actually look him up on Wikipedia to see what what made him uh, go to the dark side and really didn't really see anything jumping out at me there other than he was just kind of going in to try and lure out Dooku's apprentice or whatever. So I don't really know why they decided to make him dark side before making him a light side character, which he kind of more fits toward in the uh, in the cartoon. So but yeah, I digress. Uh, I mean, there's some pretty like he seems like you can make something fun with Asajj just making kind of like a discardy deck that can have the potential potential to burst for a lot. You could run stuff like uh, the Emperor's Favor. You could run Meditate to actually like help you get to those specials a lot easier. But I mean, I don't think it's going to be top tier ever. It could be fun. It might be worth playing around with, but it, and it's probably better than Ventress Dooku would have been. Yeah, he kind of reminds me of Luminara, where we saw the card and we're like, oh, if only a few points less or a little more health or something. Like, he's just so close to being good, and he's not quite there. Because initially you look at him and you think, okay, he's a mill deck capitalization character. Like, you mill him out, then you hit him for like three to five damage, and then you can use melee and blah, blah, blah. And he's just not really that character. He's not as efficient as you want him to be. And it's kind of that trap where you look at the special and you go, okay, this is how it's going to work. I don't think it's going to do that. I I like the fact that he is very fair. But I also have the same problem with that statement because the decks that are good run unfair characters. And so he's just kind of fighting this uphill battle. And I don't know if he'll ever get anywhere outside of, like Nick said, you know, he's fun. But I'm not sure he's going to win you a store championship or regional at any point. I will say you can do some fun setups with him with boundless if you get your dice where you want them to go and your opponents you know discarded down or or just towards the end of their turn you might be able to get some sneaky damage in there so again yeah he's kind of neat but again i stand by he's very middle of the road yeah so our next card is it will all be mine this is a three cost event and it says turn each of an opponent's dice dice showing a blank to any side then resolve any number of those dice in the order of your choice as if they were your own. This card is like the biggest like blowout effect card like in the game right now. 
Like that, that could basically turn you from I'm losing this game to oh well I'm going to remove three of your dice and deal six damage to you. Oh, your character's dead. Like that. That's ridiculous. Like it costs three, which is very fitting for it. And I don't think we're going to see a ton of play for this, but I could see like throwing a one of these in like Palpatine and you're like, well, I could keep saving for Rise again or, oh my gosh, you just rolled four blanks and now I basically win. I don't know. It's a very intriguing card. I think it's a cool design and something that cost three should have an effect that powerful i feel like i'm terrified of this card just because anyone in my local meta knows that i'm really good at rolling blanks when my opponent has feel your anger and this just seems like feel your anger on the greatest of steroids so local meta please don't play this card thank you I love this card. This is like the perfect amount of control ever because not only are you dealing your opponent's die, but you're turning it to whatever you want. So you're just kind of adding pain to injury where I love it. It, The cost is perfect. It's very fair. It does exactly what you need it to do. And I like the fact that FFG is turning blanks into a usable resource. It's not something you want, but now we've got a lot of removal. We've got control control, manipulation, and ways to actually see blanks as a tool to be used instead of this red dash where you're like, well, I guess I'm pitching a card to reroll or just not doing anything because that's kind of what it's been. It's just kind of an automatic decision. Like you're either rerolling or just leaving that die and it's just too late. That sucks. Now you can put some uh, put some blanks to use with a lot of these character cards. Yeah, unfortunately, I think it's going to take a lot more setup to do to actually kind of blow somebody out with this. Uh, you know, with the villain blue cards that turn things to blank. Generally, what happens after that is your opponent then rerolls. Uh, you know, obviously they could reroll into more blanks, or you know they may uh, claim early when they don't want to pitch to reroll and have blanks sitting on the table. Uh, then you can kind of get a couple points out on this Uh, outside of, you know, tricks with uh, force push and force speed and things like that to be able to get the extra action to immediately go ahead and do this. It's going to take a lot of setup and a lot of your opponent kind of falling into your trap here. So yeah, if it goes off, it will be great and it will be glorious. Um, But (laughs) Uh, just the the times where you're just working to get this to go off for your opponent to just kind of ruin your ruin your day and then just hurt your feelings afterwards. Uh, it, it it's gonna feel bad, you know. But <laughs> if it does go off, it's gonna be great. I see it more as something that I would hold on to for a while. Like maybe I'd be the only card I carry over for multiple rounds if I'm sitting at a high enough resources and just just kind of like waiting, kind of like you do with like like. Feel Your Anger is a card I really, really hate pitching because it's so ridiculous. If you if they roll bad, if they roll three blanks, you just blow out that whole round. And this way you blow out the whole round and you deal a bunch of damage to their character or do discard their whole hand or some, some other crazy stuff. Like I, th- I think it has more use in, in kind of waiting for them to roll bad than it does for trying to manipulate their dice to the right spot and then hit them with it. Because, again, that it's like using use the force on one of your dice and being like, oh, they just removed it after I did that. That sucks. It's like, well, that's kind of what happens. All right, so the next one is kill them all. One cost, villain blue, deal one damage to each non-unique character your opponents have. So it's a really cheap event, does some area damage, cost one. I mean, yeah, that that's going to hurt like a Phasma deck to be able to just, like, oh, well, here's some damage for your guardians. But I don't know how really strong that's going to be in the end because... Spreading damage, two damage for one. It's, I mean, it's like a lightsaber throw without any prerequisites, except for they have to be unique, non-unique characters. I, I don't know if you're getting enough value out of this, unless you're just running like only damaging events in your deck, and you just kind of want to be able to burst through things as fast as you can. It's a really nice tool to have against the meta. Like if the meta becomes four character wide decks with like three non-uniques, yeah, this card's amazing. And, you'll probably see a lot of people teching it in. So it's really nice to have this card available, but I don't think it's going to see a lot of mainstream play for most decks. This card honestly really baffles me because it's designed like a sideboard card in a game that doesn't have a sideboard. There's no situation where you would reliably put this in, even if, say, the meta was 50 or even 60%, like a four non-unique list. Do I think like, oh, okay, now that's the time? It's just so awkward that, you know, often it will be a dead card. And sure, you can use it for re-rolls, but I just... I'm 
kind of annoyed personally that this card even exists just because it's so weirdly specific. And then if I want to go a layer deeper uh, for a card that says kill them all, why is it so specific on what it can hit? That just, it's even like a thematic miss on a lot of levels about the only thing I can say nice about this card is the art's super dope, and I'm sad that it's wasted here. Could be good in multiplayer formats where you're, you can hit all your opponents with it. Yeah, I was about to say that. There's people who've been trying to come up with 2v2s, people who've been trying to work on multiplayer variants and things like that. If they ever become like acknowledged as a form of a tournament, you know, Magic has two-headed giant, you know, there's, you know, FFAs, there's there's Emperor matches, 3v3s. If those ever become viable for Destiny, then this card will see a lot of value because it specifically doesn't target a single opponent it just says whatever your opponents have so you can play this for one and just blow out lots of damage in a 1v1 i do agree i don't see massive amounts of value especially when you have things like lightsaber throw and much more reliable forms of damage for one because one resource on paper may not seem like a lot but when you're comparing it mathematically to your cost curve and your economy and your efficiency, you know, some of these characters we're looking at, Grand Inquisitor, one resource is essentially three damage. Of course, it's a one in six chance, but still, you can translate one resource to three damage. This card doesn't do that. You know, one damage, one resource can be paid for four strike, which can flip you into two or three damage. So that one resource needs to be as efficient as possible. And I, I don't think that Kill Them All provides that same amount of reliable damage and consistency that you want at least in a 1v1 you know multiplayer non non multiplayer format yeah the only thing i'll say about this one is uh awesome metallica album <laughs> <laughs> all right the last card that we have spoiled for us from pirate war is hate it is a one cost villain upgrade it has redeploy and after you activate attached character you may deal it one damage to deal one damage to another character so all the feelings that I have for Kill Them All are in the inverse for hate, as I love everything about this card. I just love the design, as I've mentioned time and time again. Uh, power from Pain effects are my favorite, so being able to hurt myself in order to eke out a little more damage is great. Uh, as an upgrade, it's really versatile for uh, being able to override it. If you're the player that starts with the shields, it's almost, in essence, free damage in this, you know, vibro meta that's probably not going away, and... Uh, the redeploy is just icing on the cake that, you know, even if they kill you, like, your hate will live on. And uh, a music that really speaks to the anger that I often feel in this game. So, And lastly, of course, the art's really great. This would be a card I'd love to see, like, an extended or even another interpretation as a promo. I just think everything about this card's cool. I don't know how much it's going to get played. I think it's a really versatile card, and it has its uses, but obviously... It also can make you lose faster, so it takes a little bit of finesse. But I think it has some real gains if you play it well. Just be well aware that it does hit you first. So in the purposes of like tiebreakers and stuff, uh, it'll kill you. Yeah, this works really well with uh, the Shoto lightsaber that we saw earlier. Uh, you know, if you have two weapons on the character, you activate, you can choose to trigger the shoto first to give it a shield and then you know remove that shield and deal one damage to another character the rita boy is just funny i think uh just spreading the hate so yeah i like it it just seems cool i mean it's kind of like it, it, it's not unblockable so like shields it's not it's really bad against shields because you're dealing damage to yourself and if you don't have shields and they do it feels pretty bad but you don't have to you it is a may effect you do not have to do the damage to either character there i don't know it's probably cool there's probably some decks that'll make some really good use out of it it would be interesting if something like that was available to hero because hero does have a lot more shield and you'd be able to like more reliably be blocking it with the shield while still dealing the dam dealing damage out but you can't have a card called hate and put it on hero can you no probably not i mean there's not much to it it's just really simple and it pings you and then it pings them i don't know what else to say i mean it is one resource so it's very efficient in terms of cost the redeploy is probably the most interesting part because it 
would appear that FFG assumes your character is going to die much faster and you probably want to keep this card alive. It's really nuts in that you could use this kill your own character and then move it over and then activate the next guy and do it again like it sets up some uh really uh interesting combos and versatile actions i i i just want to reiterate um this is one of my favorite design cards in all of destiny this card's just amazing to me i think it slots really well into uh, like a four character three color deck uh where you have two stormtroopers just passing hate back and forth between each other with the uh <laughs> with endless ranks there <laughs> a lot of times you you get into a situation where your opponents don't deal damage to the uh to the stormtroopers until late in the game uh to try to avoid them coming back from the uh the endless ranks but then being able to do damage to themselves kind of puts you into when you get to pick when you're going to ra- uh, endless ranks as opponents to your opponent trying to kill them off both at the same turn so yeah just passing that hate back and forth you get, you get hate out you get backup muscle and you get uh you, attrition you play attrition that that terrible yeah. card that nobody plays i love that card i've i've, I've won a tournament the other night because it's of it. terrible in almost every deck almost a four character deck with endless ranks is pretty much the only place it has any use but like, yeah, with something like hate, I mean, that's just a lot of direct damage that you get for free. And that's what I was going to say. If you've ever played a card game, this is a very subtle but scary effect because in so many ways, Destiny is not reliable. And this card is 100% reliable. The cost is you have to ping yourself, but you will 100% of the time get a damage. Whether a shield eats that damage or not is dependent on the situation. But in Destiny, like so many decks and so many players are trying to find ways to get reliable, consistent damage through dice. And this is just, hey, turn one, put this on a guy. You deal one to you, you deal one to them. Like that's what's going to be really interesting is especially if you can spread out the damage or heal the damage or shield up against the damage, then you're essentially netting free damage because, you know, you didn't take one and they did take one or you heal yourself and the same, you know, same thing happens. Like you're dealing them damage, you're not taking it and adding dice onto that means just consistently being able to outpace your opponent. Lastly, probably the best part of this card is whenever you did a kill with it, you can say, I literally hated you to death. (laughs) (laughs) As long as they don't have the high ground. Oh, (laughs) and there it is. All right. Well, that is pretty much the end of the show. Thank you so much for coming on, Taxter. We greatly appreciate your time and having you on the show. It's always a blast. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for inviting me back. It's always a good time. So Gen Con is wrapped up. We are preparing for Nova, and we are just really excited for all the things coming out with big tournaments, new spoilers, an entirely new set and we've got some surprises coming up in the next few weeks if you haven't heard our new show the galactic senate definitely check that out it is in the same feed as knights of ren it is really funny we're totally goofy talking about all kinds of stuff we bring on our audience members from discord and patreon to talk about pretty much whatever they want to discuss and it's just a blast so if you've listened to it and you're interested in joining us hit us up on discord send sugi a pm let me know if you want to come on otherwise thank you for joining us we hope you guys have a great week and may the force be with you